Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Taylor and Unity United Methodist Churches. It's always a blessing to participate in this worship service. It's exciting that we've opened our doors again for worship, and it's wonderful to be in the presence of those who feel secure in returning. For those of you who do not feel safe yet, that's okay. We're going to continue worshiping together online, and when you do feel safe again, the house will be open and ready for you. I do encourage you, though, if you're not attending at the, the church buildings themselves, I do encourage you, if you are a member of either church, please send your tithes and offerings. The utilities and expenses won't stop. Thank goodness the uh, utilities are less since we're not in the buildings so much, but I encourage you to mail your tithes to the church. The, addre the address will remain up at the end of the worship service. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Almighty God, we come to you to acknowledge that you are the creator of this world and everything in it. We thank you, Lord, and we love you so very much. And we can only wonder sometimes why you even love us. The world and our country are in such a mess right now, Lord, and confusion reigns. I know that you are not a God of confusion, not a God of chaos. But I also know that out of all this terrible crate, craziness and chaos you can bring something wonderful out of it something wonderful and great bring forth your power god unite us once more as a church and as a nation we pray for your protection during this pand pandemic and that this virus is conquered soon we ask these things as we pray pray the prayer jesus taught us to pray saying our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My young disciples will gather around. Oh. 
We have an old Bible story to talk about today in uh, worship, and it's from Genesis, and it's the story of Abraham and Sarah. And you know, it's really a story of promises. You know, people make promises every day. Sometimes we give we give another person as a sign of our promise. We give something to them. Sometimes we sign our names to seal our promise. Or sometimes we just give our word to another person that we will do something. Or maybe, maybe, I think I did this in church one Sunday, pinky promise. Maybe as a child you've made a pinky promise with somebody and that's a pretty serious prom promise. Well, I'm sure you've all seen a ring similar to the, similar to this. Oops, it's kind of hard to find the camera. When a man and woman get married, they usually usually make promises to one another. They may some say something like, "I promise to love you for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, as long as." they both shall live. And then they give each other a ring as a symbol of that promise. You know, the other day I received in the mail a, this precious card from Mr. Bobby and Miss, P Miss KK. You can see my name on the front of it. See there, Pastor Carol Moore. And in the corner, though, you see this. What's that? That's right, it's the stamp. This, this stamp is a symbol of a promise to Mr. Bobby and Miss KK that the post office would deliver, the, de deliver it to the person whose name is on the envelope. In this case, it's me. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy or sunny or really hot like a few of the days have been lately, or raining or snowing. The mail gets delivered. That's the promise that this stamp represents. Now you're too young to have a credit card, but I've got a credit card here. And most adults have credit cards, and probably one day you will, when you're responsible enough to have credit. But when you buy something using your credit card, you usually sign a ticket. And when you sign the ticket, that's your promise that you're going to pay the bill that you're going to pay for the items that you bought using that credit card. So your signature is your promise. Well, people make promises every day. You probably make promises. Do people always keep their promises? Unfortunately, some people don't. But you know, God makes promises too. The Bible is full of God's promises. I've been seeing some beautiful rainbows on the um, computer the last this last week from some people who posted them when they saw them. And, you know, the, the rainbow is God's promise to Noah that he wouldn't destroy the earth with a flood. So, does God always keep his promises? Yes, he does. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is one that says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. That's what our Bible lesson teaches us today. God keeps his promises. Our Bible lesson today is about a promise God made to a couple who were more than 80 years old. God promised them that they would have a baby boy and that the child would be the father of a, a great nation. Can you imagine someone 80 years old having a baby? It probably sounds funny to you. Kind of sounds funny to me too. Well, you know what? 
It sounded funny to the lady in our story, too. Sarah is her name, and she was married to Abraham. And when God made that promise, Sarah laughed. She was inside the tent, and she heard it from behind the tent flap, and she laughed. And after she laughed, she was asked, Is anything too hard for God? I'll ask you this morning, Is anything too hard for God? Absolutely not. Do you think God kept his promise to Abraham and Sarah? That's right, he did. Our scripture, the scripture that I want to that I want to leave you with this morning is The Lord said to Abraham, "Why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord?" At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. So wouldn't it be great if you and I were as faithful in keeping our promises to God as He is in keeping His promises to us? Let's pray, boys and girls. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness in keeping your promises. Help us to be faithful in keeping our promises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham, Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seas of the finest flour and knead it and make some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before him. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Will I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Fill all those listening to this message today with your Holy Spirit, and may only your words be lifted up and heard today. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Today's scripture centers around three individuals, God, Abraham, and Sarah. God, disguised as a human, with two of his angels, came to see Abraham there by the Oaks of Mamre. The angels are the same two who later lead Lot and his family from Sodom. Abraham doesn't recognize God. He just sees three tired and thirsty travelers as they come in from the desert where the temperatures are often well over a hundred, even in the shade. Abraham is seated under the oaks outside the doors of his tent and he addresses the travelers as he sees them walking up. The greeting Abraham uses in verse three, my Lord is used as a courtesy and doesn't mean that he knows this is the Lord, his God. We know it is the, lo the Lord because it's capitalized in the first verse. His offer of food, rest, and water is another way that we know that he thinks it's just three guys on a journey. This entire episode in Genesis is a test of both Abraham's and Sarah's hearts. I believe that God is always testing us. It isn't like those spelling tests in elementary school that always came on Friday with advanced warning. I mean, let's face it, if you know someone is going to aggravate you in, in advance, then it's easy to keep your temper in check and to be nice and it's easy to pass those kinds of tests. But you know, God doesn't test us that way. His tests come when we least expect it, like being cut off in traffic or seeing how we react when that last toy robot disappears on a, at a Black Friday sale or seeing the last roll of toilet paper disappear from a shelf during a pandemic or says something that you don't like. What happens then? That's the test. Please don't leave here today saying that I said God caused the pandemic or the riots that's been going on or anything that's gone wrong in your life. That's not what I'm saying this, this morning. These situations themselves are not the test. The test is how we respond to them. How we respond to everyday circumstances. These are the tests of God. These are the ways God tested Abraham. In Romans 12, 1, Paul advises us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We can do this when we come to the front of the church to rededicate ourselves or to give our lives to God, but that isn't the, the test. The test is presenting our bodies as, li as living sacrifices. That test of presenting them comes when a situation in our lives, in our daily lives comes that makes us ask the question, am I really available to do what he wants? Am I ready to respond to someone else's need? Am I ready to meet a demand that interrupts my busy life? These are the tests that God presented to Abraham when he came without calling first. Abraham ran in and told Sarah, and they prepared a fine feast for the three men. Even though they had hundreds of servants who have, that could have done it all, Abraham and Sarah participated in the preparation. Before long, the meal was ready, and the men ate, and Abraham stood there under the trees and visited with them as they ate. 
This is a beautiful picture for us today. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. We will fellowship with the Lord, have dinner together. This isn't just for our private enjoyment. It's a picture of the Lord using us to meet the needs of those around us. When we do that, we enter into fellowship with the heart of Christ. And when Christ enters that door of our heart, he doesn't just come in to make us have a joyful experience so that we feel all warm and fuzzy. He comes in to show us how to minister to the needs of others. He comes to minister through us. You know, there is a statue, I believe it's in Germany, of, of uh, a statue of Jesus where the hand, his hands were blown off during the war. And they decided to keep it. And they put a plaque there that says, Jesus has no hands but yours. Jesus comes to minister through us. This is the test he said he would apply to our lives in Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. This is a test of our faith. When we don't do those things, we leave Jesus in need. But when we do, Matthew 25, 40 is such a blessed statement. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I think about this when we just had annual conference yesterday and and we talked about the 20,000, the, I mean, sorry, the 200,000 reasons um, project of the conference. And we've lowered it now to, I believe they said it was 162,000 children in Arkansas who go to bed hungry. So we need to be thinking about this. When we help feed those hungry children, those hungry people, we are not doing it just to them or for them. We're doing it to Jesus. We may do it for them, but we're doing it to Jesus. Abraham didn't feed his guests in order to gain something for himself or even to impress anybody. For all he knew, these three men were penniless desert nomads that he wouldn't ever see again. These tests come to us every day. What do we do when they come? Do we run and hide or run to meet the challenge as Abraham did? After the men finished eating, they asked where Sarah was. This might have been a clue to Abraham that these weren't ordinary men, because after all, they called her Sarah rather than Sarai. For God had changed her name earlier, but they called her Sarah. Then when they spoke of Sarah having a child, Abraham was pretty sure he knew who they were. From the behind the tent entrance, though, Sarah heard the question and the promise, and she was cynical and, and laughed to herself. But the Lord knew she had laughed, and he asked Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Sarah was afraid because her heart was open and known to God. She denied what she had done, but God wasn't going to let her by with it. And he said, oh, but you did. Sarah's laughter was cynical, unbelieving, but that wasn't to be the end of the story. 
if it had been, there would be the temptation to wonder why Sarah is considered a good example in the Bible. I mean, because let's face it, up until now, she's done some pretty strange things. But the rest of Sarah's story is revealed in Hebrews, where Sarah's name is listed in the heroes of faith. Hebrews 11.11, 11, if, if Hebrews 11.11 11 were all of the story, we'd be tempted to say that she really wasn't any example to follow. But over in the New Testament, in this book of Hebrews, we get the rest of the story. There in that wonderful 11th chapter, the Hall of Fame of the Heroes of Faith, Sarah's name appears. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. After the men left, Sarah realized she had been in the presence of the Lord. I can only imagine how many times she must have asked the question that God asked her. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord, the Creator, the one who created the world and everything in it and who sustains us all? Is it, as she pondered that question, she had to realize that nothing was too hard for God. If He had promised it, then it would happen. His will would be done to borrow a familiar phrase from the Lord's Prayer. We say it every Sunday, Thy will be done. Through faith, she received power to conceive because she knew God was faithful. Faith goes beyond contrary circumstances to rest upon the character of the one who promised. Faith doesn't just stand by itself. It isn't simply believing. Faith has a promise to rest upon. When God has given His Word, it is the Word of God. It can be trusted regardless of circumstance, feeling, or anything else. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah rested upon that and believed God. Does it seem too hard for you to be what God wants you to be? It's not too hard for the Lord. Is it too hard for you? Does it seem too hard that some friend that you're praying for would ever be converted? Does it seem impossible that that relative rebelling against grace can ever be changed? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there something God is asking of you that you might feel is impossible to perform? It might be hard for you, but it's not too hard for the Lord. And if you are under the Lord's Spirit, it won't be too hard for you. In the Bible, we often read the phrase, but God. Google it. Some people have written articles about it and others have made lists of but God scriptures. In every one of those scriptures though, in every one of those but God statements, all kinds of things are going wrong. Then the Spirit of God writes and adds two huge words. But God. And the entire situation changes defeat to victory. God offers to respond to us just as he did Abraham and Sarah. 
when we are oppressed and confronted with circumstances beyond our control through prayer we can sense some prompting of the spirit that gives us a word of faith to rest upon then like Sarah we might ask is anything too hard for the Lord no he is able to perform all that he says he will. Would you receive this benediction? Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>